Right, hello, welcome. Um, I'm really relishing the opportunity to speak in the Philippines. Uh, it's a great shame I'm not actually in the Philippines because it's absolutely pouring it down with rain here in the UK and it's gone fairly cold, so we're still waiting for spring to arrive. I do like the good weather. I'm sure you were all nice and warm over there. Okay, so my name is Sam Wayne. I'm a uh, senior lecturer at Harper Adams University. And um, I'm going to present today, my, the title of my presentation is Automated Agriculture. And I'm going to talk about some of the developmental challenges that we have today and try and look towards the future as well. So the format of today, I will talk a little bit about Harper Adams University, who we are and where we are. And then I will speak a bit about some of our projects that we're involved in. And then I will introduce some of the particular challenges that we are facing and that we're trying to address. Um, but it's a new area that we're all working together in. And I'm hoping that it will inspire some of you watching to do some research in this area. Um, perhaps make contact with us as well and lend us your expertise. So we are always listening. Okay, so Harper Adams University, we're in the middle of England, really. Um, quite near the Welsh border, but right there in the middle. Uh, we're an old university, founded in 1901. We have a lot of land. We are really quite rural. We're uh, in the countryside with uh, about 540 hectares. And we are a working farm as well as a university. And we have courses in areas such as crops, animals, animal management, food, land management and engineering. We're a small university of around about 2,500 students. And we are very unique in the UK in that we are the only agricultural university that has an engineering degree that you can do engineering uh, for agriculture. So just a, a bit of a bird's eye view of our area and you can see that we are here in the middle of this area and we own most of the land around here as well. So our site is in the middle and, and to the left here. We have student houses, we also have greenhouses and lots of land. So you can see uh, a pie chart of the, um, the items that we have. We have cows and um, different types of crops as well. So just zooming in on our actual campus itself, you can't really read the labels here, but um, just some items I'm particularly proud of. In the bottom right hand corner here, you've got the soil, uh, sorry, the off-road vehicle track where students race their vehicles. We also have the site of the hands-free hectare, the bottom middle as well, where we have robots farming the land. Um, and here at the, at the middle right hand side, we have our soil hall, where we have a large indoor field and machinery shop. Uh, workshop, as, as well as um, a variety of sports facilities, an outdoor heated swimming pool and a whole agricultural um, engineering center and uh, uh, different areas, crop management, etc., uh, crop research centers, things like that. So we are a working farm as well, and that runs separately to the university, but it is within the university or the university is within the farm and um, we have a beef unit so we have uh, 130 finished cattle per year so you can go out and see the cows we have a dairy unit where we sell the milk to the big supermarkets so around about 400 cows we have a pig unit so you can see the piglets in them in the springtime poultry uh, about 100,000 chickens so we always joke that we have more chickens than we have students and a sheep unit, um, so about 200 uh, ewes. And what you can see in the picture here is we have a rotation um, dairy unit. So the cows get onto this rotating dairy and, and get milked as they move around the dairy. So that's quite a, a modern innovation. We also have a robotic dairy where the, the cows can 
walk into this area and a robot arm will milk them. So we have uh, two of those and it's solar powered or it has solar panels on the top of it as well. So let me take you to the engineering because that's the, the bit that I really want to focus on. And you can see some uh, photographs of the, the building on the outside and then the workshop on the inside and one of the robots that we've developed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. So we are the home of the National Center for Precision Farming. So precision farming is a real buzzword now, which means that we are caring for every individual plant need. So it's the precision. And we get that precision from using advanced GPS, very accurate GPS, which has a, around about a one centimeter accuracy. I mean, the GPS is so accurate that it can uh, distinguish across the palm of your hand several times over. We also have tractor laboratories, lecture theatres, offices, mechatronic teaching rooms, project laboratories, and students get an, uh, an office as well. So here's a, a view of one of our lecture theatres, and I suppose what's a bit different and unique about this lecture theatre is, beside the fact that it's got a tractor in the middle of it, is you can see the roller shutter doors on the right hand side, is where we can bring in large vehicles for using with our teaching. And they're often used by companies for demonstrations as well. So it's a nice lecture room to, to be in. And the roller shutter doors go out to the field so we can see things coming in and out of the field. Now, I am the course leader for an award, which is Applied Mechatronic Engineering. So it's a master's, MSc. It's a one year course and um, it's a very vibrant course. It's a very hands on course. You can see some of the modules that we have here, which include everything from research skills right through to advanced mechatronics and agricultural robotics. So students learn the basics of um, mechatronics and then they learn how to uh, build their own robots, how to connect the robots, how to connect laser scanners and really take you right to the cutting edge of robotics, but with an application um, for farming. And you can see here a picture of myself with surrounded by some students and we made this into a, a robot tractor and it's got laser scanners on the side because that was used for scanning the uh, canopy of fruit, the growth canopy of fruit. Okay, so that's a bit about Harper Adams. I'm just going to move on to current farming practices and, and how we're hoping to address them and some of the challenges that we have. Well, you can see a particular challenge here. So I don't need to explain much of what's going on here, except for in the UK, we generally have a lot of rain. Now, when we have rain, we have tractors that go into the field and they really crush the subsoil. So they're ruining the state of the soil by the mass of the tractor working on ground which is fairly wet and it's not really made for having large tractors on. And you've probably noticed that tractors are getting bigger and bigger these days. And the reason why is because farmers like to have larger tractors that can pull through the soil quicker. They've got more torque, more pulling power, more horsepower they can get the job done quickly uh, but this is at the expense of the soil so most of the energy of a tractor is trying to undo the damage that they've done in the first place so one of our initial projects is to make very light robot tractors and our idea is that if we can have a multitude of these robot tractors working together, they can cover just as much ground as quickly or even quicker than one large tractor. And you can see that some students have actually made that. They were master's students and they got a grass cutting tractor and they turn it into a radio control tractor. But on that ground, if you walk onto that ground, it's at field capacity, which means it was in that Photograph was taken in February. We'd had a lot of rain over the winter. And as soon as you step foot on it, your foot sank into the ground. So you've got a flooded footprint. But what you probably can't notice on the right hand side is the tire track. So the pressure on the tires 
uh, exert on the ground is a lot less than a person's footprint because the, the um, pressure is spread out more and we're experimenting with low pressure tires as well. So the idea is we are also taking away the weight of the human being and the tractor is only doing what it needs to do and it only has, it only carries what it needs to do to do the job. So it's relatively light and you can still use many of these to do the same job. So I'll give you an idea. So for example, if you have these robots in synchronization, they can do synchronized planting. Now there's, there's two reasons why we're looking at this. Not only are the tractors in communication and they can cover the ground quite quickly, but you can see in this diagram that they, they are punch planting the seeds into very specific locations. We don't have to do it like that, but there is one particular advantage. So if we plant the seeds in specific locations, what happens is the seeds grow, but then we get these red bits. And I probably don't need to explain to you what these little red things represent. They're something that we haven't planted, but they appear anyway, and they are the weeds. Now what we can do is if we know the, the exact location of all of those plants, we can do inter-row and even intra-row hoeing. So this is organic farming without needing any technology except for to know the spacing of the seeds. So that's one opportunity that we have. Another opportunity is we might be using micro-spraying. So why spray the entire field when you can save 99.9% .9 of your pesticide and herbicide by just spraying where the weeds are. Now you can use a camera to recognize the weeds or you can just uh, know anything that's green and isn't in the place that uh, an item has been planted. You can say, well, it, that's, that must be a weed. So you can spray that quite easily. It doesn't need too much processing power to do that. Now we don't have to micro spray. Uh, we have done research in a hyper weeding system and what this is, is it was built into a canopy that you see on the right hand side and it had a very powerful laser inside it. And that laser was used to really blast the weeds or really, we, we didn't really blast them out of the soil, but we tried to see how little power we could get away with um, and still stop the weed from growing. So the weed would just die and then it would be recycled in the ground. So we have a, a light source and then we have a camera. So the light source and the camera recognize the weeds specifically. And then we have a laser which is moving on a gimbal. So the gimbal can move to the exact location of the weed and fire a 60 watt laser pulse directed directly at the weed. And this can all happen as it's moving along on the back of a tractor. So we don't even need a robot to, to drive it along. So you have your weeder system which is moving the laser to, uh, to attack the weeds. But it could be on the back of a robot. So this was a separate unit. The problem with the laser weeder is it's a treating one weed at a time. So it can be quite slow. It takes about one second of laser application to kill a weed. And that's why we had it on a gimbal as well. So it was tracking the weed position as the tractor was moving along. Now, by the time the tractor has completed one whole field, because it has to run quite slowly, it might be time to start the same field again. Now, that's not very good for a tractor driver, but if we have robots doing that, they don't care. As long as they've got power, they can keep weeding continuously. Another area of our development is in selective harvesting. So this is a, a bit of a, a, a fantasy diagram, which was pr produced for us, but it does show us some points that we are actually researching in. We don't have any robots that look like this red one, but it was the concept uh, and the idea. And the idea is, as you can see at the right hand, bottom right hand corner, you've got lettuce leaves which have been left behind, or whole lettuce which have been left behind. Now what's happening is the robot is moving along the crops and it's looking at the lettuce 
and it's only harvesting the ones that it needs. So if a lettuce is too small to harvest, it will leave it behind, take a note of its GPS location, and then it can always come back for it maybe in a week's time when it's larger. So it only selects and harvests the particular lettuce that it needs. It might be that a shop wants particularly small lettuce, so it can go out and find the small lettuce or large lettuce, however we want. Now currently when it's manual harvesting, the whole field is just completely obliterated of lettuce. Many of them are thrown away because they're maybe too small or not quite right, or maybe they're, they're too big uh, and they've been left in the ground for too long. But with selective harvesting, we can be very precise and focus just on the crops that we need. So some of the vehicles that we've built, um, this is the one from the photo where you saw me standing on it for the uh, advertising my MSc in um, Applied Mechatronic Engineering. And these are some of the components. So we, we took a, an existing tractor and we put some components on it to turn it into a robot. Notably a microcontroller and a computer. So what we've got is it's really our philosophy is we don't build robots from the beginning. We take existing vehicles, which we know work like a tractor, and then we turn it into a robot, robotize it, if you like. So how do we do it? How do we build robots? Well, it's actually very simple. What we do is re we replace the steering actuator with a motor. So you can see some examples here. So for example, if I take the hands-free hectare uh, vehicle, we have a motor uh, and there's a zoom in here on the bottom left-hand corner. And it's just simply a DC motor with a gearbox and it's a toothed belt, which is going onto the steering actuator. And that's it. Uh, there'll be feedback here, normally in the case of a potentiometer. So it knows the actual steering angle, or we might even use a stepper motor. In the middle here, you can also see a combine harvester, the same vehicle, and you can see how we activate the, um, the brake on it. So the brake is a linear motor, which just is literally pushing down on the brake pedal. So it's quite easy to do. You can see another vehicle we've got here, which is an electric vehicle, and we've got a steering motor on here, and we're about to attach, attach actuators onto the uh, the brake as well. The accelerator is a bit easier because it's an electric vehicle. We can either um, put an actuator directly into the butterfly valve of the carburetor or we can put a linear actuator on the accelerator pedal. You can see at the bottom right we can encapsulate all of the control into a nice neat package which consists of a microcontroller and just some driver boards and then all of that can communicate to a computer which is running navigation software for example, and um, being more intelligent and uh, doing the route planning and things like that. So I've taken a, a little snip of uh, text here from a, a white paper, which I uh, helped to write. And it's really that the advantage of modern robotics is their ability to be built using low cost, lightweight and smart components. Because we've all got mobile phones, we've all got the power of computing in our pockets. Since the whole world is buying them, all of this has become cheaper and cheaper. So it's the prevalence of consumer electronics, uh, which makes low cost and high quality microcontrollers available. Uh, and then the motors themselves, the different actuators, linear actuators, rotation motors are very low cost as well relatively speaking. So you can make a robot quite easily. One of our philosophies is to make a an apparatus that can attach to old farm machinery and give it new life. We don't want to br build brand new shiny farming machinery, especially as a robot. We want to make use of, of what we've got. So we also teach robotics and navigation, as you saw in my uh, module layout and how we do that is I developed a robot and this robot was built from a radio controlled car it's a four-wheel drive radio controlled car 
all-terrain buggy. And what I did was I took out the radio receiver and I replaced it with a microcontroller and a GPS and a compass. So the buggy knows its direction and it knows its location. So it's quite simple to learn to program the navigation strategy into the vehicle. And I run many classes on practical robot, outdoor robot navigation doing this. This is the basics of navigation. We do take it further. If, you're, if you've heard of ROS, Robot Operating System, we also use that. We use SLAM, which is Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. So we use those as, as higher level functions as well. And um, you might recognize this chap. This is Anton Bautista, who came from your university. And he studied with me for a year and he developed the robot that you can see in the picture here. So this was built on from a child's quad bike. Uh, and all um, we did, or Anton did mostly, was to put a steering actuator in it, just a linear motor, and to make a motor driver. So it, it drives autonomously. And you can see he's put a GPS receiver on near the front. He's put bumpers on, uh, a light for uh, just a, you know showing that it's there. Uh, a GPS is on the stick here. Sorry, not GPS, that's a compass, and it has to be away from the magnetism of the motors. And he used that to show that we could have an autonomous vehicle navigate around and perhaps apply it to the use of rice paddy transplanting. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the challenges that we have. So a real farm doesn't just want navigation and a lot of the vehicles assume that we've got a nice perfectly flat farm and all we need to do is make robots that drive around it. Uh, I've taken a little clip from a YouTube video here which is a, just a fantasy uh, clip but it's worth having a look at because it shows you that on the farm navigation isn't the biggest problem. Really we've got lots and lots of other tasks to do moving trees around, uh, chopping hedges, uh, picking up things and moving them from one place to the other. So a real farm doesn't just need navigation, we need a lot more. So I've, I've put together some of the tasks that I think uh, farmers need. So let's have a look at some of the problems on the farm. One is set up and forget. So farmers aren't generally interested in watching technology, they want to get it and use it. They want to be able to press a button and then they can forget about it. Um, on the farm we have other problems that we might not always be able to anticipate. For example, animal carcasses, uh, crops which have been eaten, and of course we've got rain and mud which change the, uh, the traction of vehicles. Things like fallen fences, fallen trees, breakdown of machines. If something goes wrong, if one sensor goes wrong, do we want the whole robot to stop? Really, we want to look at graceful degradation. Uh, and that's used a lot in Mars rovers. So if you have a rover on, the Mar on Mars, if one sensor breaks, we don't want to abort the whole mission, it's just a waste of money. So they have many sensors that can compensate. So if one wheel gets stuck, they've got other wheels which can provide traction. If one sensor stops working, they've got other sensors which can um, work around that sensor and cooperate together. Um, variable input from humans, sick days. The Luddites, well the Luddites were people who were around in the, um, the turn of the Industrial Revolution and they really didn't want any kind of machinery or mechanization because they believed it was taking their jobs. So they used to go in, break into places, and they would break the machinery. And you might think that maybe that does, maybe it doesn't happen now. I've personally had it happen where people have um, broken or stolen a part of a robot. So there are people who are very uh, apprehensive about mechanization and, um, uh, you know, they don't trust it. Um, we have variable demand uh, of different types of crops, variable weather, of course. Hedges, maintenance, blocked ditches, ditches escaped animals, and, and really to reskill the human beings who'll be working with the 
machinery. Because we don't want to just have machinery that will replace human beings. We want the humans to work with the machinery. So it's that cooperation. And I think that human-robot collaboration is something I've put in the, the areas to solve. It's not as if we have robots which suddenly just come in and everybody else has to go home. The robots will work with the people and maybe do the jobs that the people don't like to do much anyway. But the people still need to work alongside the robots, passing them things, taking them from the robots and also controlling the robots and telling them what to do and where to go. Um, locomotion is one of the first things to solve because wheels are fine. But as I mentioned, you've got rain, you've got fallen debris, um, all sorts of problems needed to be solved with locomotion to get out of ditches, rain, dry. Manipulation. How do you handle all of the tasks from the very delicate strawberry to the very large tree trunk? Adaptability. Now, with the advent of 3D printers, it could be that every farm has got a 3D printer. It could even be that every robot has a 3D printer on board. So if it break, if something breaks, the robot could just print its own, fit it in itself as well. So complete adaptability and also uh, it's fixing itself. Planning, coordination. How do we plan 10 robots to do one job? The robots need to learn and to be able to adapt as well to new tasks, just like we do. So one particular project we had to solve was strawberry picking. Now this was also a case of selective harvesting because we didn't want every strawberry to be picked. We only wanted the red strawberries to be picked. Every strawberry is recognized and its GPS location is recorded. So therefore it can come back and pick the red strawberries later on. We had to recognize the strawberry, but not only that, we wanted to grasp. We didn't want to grasp the actual strawberry itself. We wanted to grasp the the um, the top part, the peduncle of the strawberry, the little stalk. So as you can see a diagram in the bottom uh, in the bottom here, that the green part is a bit that we wanted to grasp. And we developed a, a very clever gripper that could grasp the peduncle, the stalk, and also cut it at the same time and still hold the strawberry and then put it into the skillet or the container for it to be packed. So no strawberry was actually touched by robot or human in the packing of it. So in the UK, we are we have a lot of white papers and there's a, a link there for you, which is worth looking at. Uh, these white papers are written by academics who are working in the fields of robotics and technology. Uh, in collaboration with the people who are using the technology and who need to use the technology. And they're often used to inform government and the general public about things. So I've contributed to the one on agricultural robotics, and we are actually writing another one, which is involved in the training that humans will need in order to use robots on the farm. So here's a little snip that I've taken from the white paper, that the development of field robots can assist workers by carrying payloads, and conduct agricultural operations such as crop and animal sensing, weeding and drilling. Integration of autonomous systems technologies into existing farm operational equipment such as tractors. And that's what I mentioned before, where we've got motors that we can do the steering. We don't have to rebuild the tractor. Robotic systems to harvest crops and conduct complex dexterous operations. The use of collaborative and the human in the loop robotic applications to augment worker productivity. So we want humans and robots to work together and learn from each other. Another project which has got a lot of worldwide press was the original, originally it was a hands free hectare, uh, which was a completely robotically um, planted and cared for and harvested hectare of ground. And now that's moved on to the hands-free farm, where it's an entire farm which is robotically uh, harvested. And the hands-free farm is a bit more complicated because autonomous machinery will have to drive across roads 
and it will drive from the uh, workshops into the field, do its job, and then come back again. So it's really looking at the whole infrastructure and the planning and the coordination as much as just a robot that we have which can navigate around. So just looking to the near future, so we have, you know, the new advances, new materials, fabrication techniques, additive manufacture, uh, advanced composites are making manufacture and deployment of robotic platforms much cheaper. And, you know, decouple from the main manufacturing process. In other words, we can make individual items now. So we could have a 3D printer. It could print spare parts on demand. Um, as I mentioned, it could even be on the vehicle itself. So, and by using collaborative and cooperative behavior in a fleet of robots f further provides the opportunity to spread the tasks over multiple platforms. Maybe one's got legs, maybe one's got wheels. Work together, do the job more efficiently and collaborate. And the main task is to reduce the damage caused by heavy conventional agricultural platforms on the soil. So I'll leave you there. Thank you very much for, um, for listening. And I hope it's inspired you to develop advanced agricultural machinery. Thank you very much.